Hello and welcome to the Business Today Show. I'm Udayan Mukherjee. Today we are going to talk about an interesting sector, real estate. Uh, because real estate was really out of play for many, many years as an asset class in India. Declining prices, disinterest from buyers. But all that seems to have turned around in the last year and a half. Uh, a lot of people are now talking about a proper real estate cycle after a long time. Is that true? And could it be a consistent cycle, not just a flash in the pan? Who better to ask than the chairman, executive chairman of the largest listed real estate company in India, Godrej Properties. I have with me today uh, Pirocha Godrej, executive chairman of the company. Uh, Pirocha, great to see you again and wonderful to connect after many years. Likewise, Adrian. Great to be with you and looking forward to the chat. So, uh, enlighten us. I mean, you're in the best position or the best seat in the house to tell us whether this is indeed a proper real estate cycle because I've heard both versions that it I mean it was pent up for such a long time pre-COVID or around COVID that this is just a release of that pent up demand and maybe it will not sustain but the gaining view is that this is really a multi-year real estate cycle that we have embarked on which which camp are you on? Yeah, well then clearly, um, I, I think this argument that it's just COVID probably has now passed its sell-by date because, you know, we're in probably now the 18th month or so of what's been a pretty strong uh, recovery. And it makes perfect sense, right? Uh, I think the real estate cycles in India, if you look back, uh, several decades have typically been you'd have uh, seven, eight years of cycle in each direction. It varies a little bit, but not by too much in, in most cases. And this down cycle really started around 2012. And I think may have actually the recovery may have started even sooner. But we had one uh, shock hitting the system after the other most recently, of course, the, the pandemic. But I do think all evidence that, that we're seeing would suggest that the recovery has begun in full earnest and, and, and will likely continue for some time. Is it an even recovery, Pirocha, though? I mean, do you see it across the country or is it being led by a few pockets only? Because sometimes when recoveries or the cycle starts, it can be a little uneven. I mean, you see a few pockets actually doing very well and then the tail kicks in later. What is it this time? Uh, what is it like this time? Well, then I think what we're seeing is, is pretty strong demand across the board. If we speak from a geographic perspective, most of our exposure is in the top four markets in the country of Mumbai, NCR, Bangalore and Pune. All four of those cities, I'm happy to report, uh, are doing very well, are seeing strong momentum. I think if I had to choose amongst them, you'd probably say the NCR market is doing the best. It tends to be the most volatile of the four markets, so it tends to lead the way both in the cyclical upturn as well as in the downturn. At least that's what we've observed the last couple of cycles. So we're seeing that again. The NCR market has seen not just volumes come back quite sharply, but a fair amount of pricing growth as well. I think the other markets have also seen very strong volumes, uh, but perhaps somewhat less pricing growth than NCR so far. Hmm. How would you rank your four key markets in terms of the demand price, with general interest metrics that you're seeing between Bombay, Delhi, Pune and Bang Bangalore? You know, as I was saying, I think I'd probably say NCR at the current moment is the is the strongest of the four. If you look at Pune and Bangalore, they tend to be a little bit similar, more steady markets, don't see huge swings either on the downside or the upside. So I think those markets are performing very well. Pricing in those markets also tends to be at the top end, much lower than places like Delhi and, and Mumbai, which I think makes uh, affordability that much better at, at the luxury end of the, uh, of the, the spectrum. But, you know, I, I think, honestly, all four are doing well. If I had to put them in, in some sort of order, I'd probably say NCR is doing the best. Bombay is also now recovering very well, at least for Godrej Properties. We've seen a sharp uptick in our, our performance there. And Pune and Bangalore also uh, also seeing quite, quite good growth. And is it the top end of the market which is doing better, the luxury end, or is it the budget end? I, again, I think it's, you know, it's really a, a demand cycle that we're seeing through the board. But I would say the change in performance at the luxury end is more noticeable because going into the pandemic, that part of the market was actually performing extremely poorly. So I think there was a, a lot of difficulty, a lot of oversupply and pockets there. So the improvement there, I think, has been somewhat more noticeable coming on that weak base. Whereas I think the, the more mid-income premium end of things was always doing quite well. Now it's doing even better. Right. And 
Is it a volume-led recovery that you're seeing over the last one year? Because some people tend to believe, uh, rightly or wrongly, that markets like Bombay are quite overpriced already to begin with. So the pricing growth is probably limited or the potential for pricing growth is limited. Do you disagree with that assertion? And are you seeing any kind of pricing improvements in the key markets? Um, so I think, you know, it, it is so far largely a volume led growth story, particularly a market like Mumbai, I'd say it's more about volume so far than pricing. We've seen probably mid to high single digit pricing increases in, in somewhere like Mumbai over the last year, which more or less is just keeping up with uh, the cost of inflation that's going into projects. Um, in cities like uh, NCR, you actually have seen pricing movement as well. But I do think that all four markets and you know, really all markets across the country will see significant pricing momentum over these next few years. If you look at a typical real estate cycle, the first year or two are led generally by volumes recovering, confidence in the market coming back, people dispelling the notion that it's some short term thing linked to a pandemic recovery or whatever the, you know, the flavor of that cycle is. Um, and getting confidence that it is here to stay. And then people realize that it's better to get off the fence and buy now. And I think we're in that place at the moment. So I do expect um, pricing to pick up. There's an anecdote I, I like to tell about sort of pricing of, of, of residential real estate in, in big markets. When, when I moved back to Bombay from, uh, from studying in the US, I actually moved into an apartment that my parents had purchased as their first home in the 1960s. Right? So we, uh, it was a long time had passed, but I lived there for a few years. And then when I actually shifted to a different place, we ended up finally selling that apartment nearly, nearly 50 years, I think, after we'd bought it. And we sold it for an amount that was almost exactly 1,000 times um, the purchase price at which my parents had got it. You know, anyone's reaction to that is sort of, oh my goodness, what a great time it must have been to be buying real estate back in those days where, you know, it was being given away for free practically. Um, and, and that's sort of how, how I was thinking about it. But I remember we had a, on, a, on one of our boards, we had someone who had been associated with the group for a long time and actually knew my dad from the time that they, they had bought this apartment. And what he told me was that actually when they bought it, everyone in the company thought they were totally crazy. And, you know, why are they spending this kind of money on, on, on real estate? It will, you know, surely lose all its value and what a, what a foolish thing to do. So I think the, the lesson from, from the anecdote, if there is one, is that in these, uh, you know, in the world's most exciting and, and, and most desirable cities, and I think Mumbai certainly is that for India, um, real estate prices always feel prohibitively expensive because to secure a home, people are committing what's usually uh, the lion's share of their total wealth and income. Um, but the other lesson is probably with hindsight that, you know, things will only, only, only keep going up. So I think barring some major economic shock in India, which I don't anticipate, um, I, I think real estate prices have significant further room for appreciation. That's a lovely anecdote. And uh, now thanks for bringing it up. But you know, uh, the other side of it, Pirocha, is that a lot of people these days uh, seem to say that real estate has lost its allure as a asset class. You know, a lot of people buy real estate to live in the houses, a lot of people invest in it, uh, have invested in it traditionally. But the lull from 2012 to 20 may have scared away a lot of people. I mean, they don't look at real estate, but they look at financial assets these days. I mean, they buy stocks, they buy bonds. Do you think a switch has turned off in the head of the Indians who were traditionally savers in gold and real estate? Could that be true? Or as this market picks back and an upcycle plays out, it will once again rediscover its charm? You know, I, I, I think probably more the latter is, is my view. Then you do, obviously, when you come out of a long eight year down cycle where people haven't seen any returns, you do see enthusiasm uh, levels dip. But I think what you also see very consistently is that people do have short memories. So whether it's about the stock market or real estate markets, I think people see opportunities and investors do tend to come back in. Honestly, my view is that the growth of the sector will be more healthy um, and, and, and more sustainable 
the less that is the case. So you will always have some amount of investment. It'll go up and down a little bit with cycles. But I think what would be very good for the country as a whole, for the economy as a whole, as well as for real estate uh, de uh, developers within the sector, is to see end-use demand really picking up on a very consistent basis. And I think that is the base expectation that we have at the moment. If you look at it between 2012 and around 2019, you actually saw real estate volumes in the country nearly half. And I think that was indicative of a lot of people waiting on the sidelines, one crisis after another, making them think prices were going to come down or economic uncertainty, uh, making them postpone their decisions. So I think now that that is hopefully passed, you will see a lot of end user demand return. But with that, as you start seeing pricing momentum, um, I do think investors um, will be back as well. And, you know, the big elephant in the room anywhere in the world today is inflation uh, and it's just refusing to come down at least in the western world and, and some amount in india as well uh, now as a real estate company do you fret about it that uh, this kind of commodity inflation that you've been witnessing you may or may not be able to pass it down to customers and might have to absorb some of it in your margins or or do you think passing down uh, would be quite easy well, then, uh, it, I think it's a bit of both depending on the time frame of the question. If you look at the very near term of you know reported earnings over this next couple of years, I do think there's going to be a margin hit because of uh, commodity price inflation. Because a lot of the way we sell our projects tends to be that you launch a project before construction starts, sell a large percentage of the inventory at that time, and then use the cash flows from customers to actually build out the development. Uh, the accounting, on the other hand, works that you only account for a project once you fully complete the project, both sales and construction. So in an environment like this, where we've sold a lot at the price that we had locked in, say, two years ago or last year, and you've seen this kind of commodity inflation, there will be some impact on margins. Because while we budget for commodity inflation, they, they, we don't obviously budget for this levels of extraordinary inflation. However, for projects that we have launched over even the last six, eight months when these levels of inflation have been more apparent, um, the pricing increases have already been taken to offset this, and those have been fortunately absorbed. So that's what I mentioned when I said about 10% on average price increase that has happened over the last year. That will fully absorb the kind of inflation we've seen. In some markets, we actually think some of the pricing now is already going to lead to margin accretiveness. Mm. And of course, the inevitable question about interest rates, because, uh, you know, it it is logical to think that a substantial increase in interest rates from here might actually dent the cycle, which is still nascent. I mean, uh, the real estate cycle is probably what one one and a half years old now. At this point, to see a fairly significant jump in interest rates and mortgage rates, do you think that might set the cycle back? Well, of course, it will have some impact, but my view is that overall the sector can absorb even increased interest rates from these levels. If you look at it, mortgage rates at around 8%, which is where we are today, is actually one of the lowest we've been in, in the country's history, really. We, of course, went even lower as a response to the pandemic and had exceptionally attractive interest rates and affordability for that year, first year, year and a half of the, uh, in response to the pandemic. But my sense is even today, if you look at interest rates, they are significantly below previous times where we've seen boom markets. So I'll give you a couple of examples in both 2004, 2005 and 2011, 2012, which were big boom years for the, the sector. You had interest rates of about 11 percent. So we still have. Um, you know, significant uh, reduction over those levels. You also have, as a general case, affordability being at much better levels today than it's been at any time in our history, again, with the possible exception of last year. Because you've had between 2012 and 2022 almost no price increases until the last year. You've had people's incomes, of course, grow up, go up significantly over that period. Over that period, interest rates have actually gone down quite a lot. So all of that means that affordability today remains quite strong. Of course, if we have another two, 300 basis points of interest rates, it will have a somewhat dampening effect. So we'll have to keep an eye on it. But overall, my sense is, barring a, a significant economic shock that creates uncertainty about uh, in people's minds about their job prospects, about whether it's a good time to buy real estate from a directional perspective of how the country is doing, I don't see too much of a challenge in the cycle sustaining. Hmm. 
And the new thing for you, of course, is Godrej Capital. And um, I've heard whispers in Bombay, people talking about the fact that this could be another Bajaj Finance in the making. Now, it's early days yet, and it's a very flattering comparison, you will concede, because they have really, Sanjeev Bajaj has achieved quite a bit over the last many years. But is that the direction you want to take Godrej Capital in? Well, that's an extremely flattering and over-flattering uh, comparison. I don't think we have any such uh, such large ambitions at this stage. We you know, want to take one step at a time. But it has been great fun starting this business. Uh, very challenging in its own way. Started right in the middle of the pandemic. We got our... Uh, our HFC license in the middle of the pandemic, uh, you know, first few months had to onboard a whole team who couldn't meet each other. So quite interesting to see see how that's progressed. But I'm very happy with the quality of team we've built there. We've got excellent leadership team in place. We now have 500 people in the organization. A couple of months ago, we crossed about 3,000 crore in assets under management there. We're a little bit ahead of our initial plans for that. So I think um, certainly far too early to be comparing us to any of the you know leading players in the, in the sector. But we, we think it's uh, been a great beginning and it's a business we're very excited about. Would you want to list it separately eventually once it uh, assumes a certain size? I think that that is the thinking. Then it is it is inherently a type of business that does require capital on an ongoing basis. So I think the thinking is that the group will will provide that capital for the first four or five years as the business establishes itself, and then uh, perhaps look to list it if if the metrics make sense at that time. Okay, but I mean, of course, your uh, main responsibility is Godrej Properties, and it's a company which was founded by your father. I, and I want you to talk a little bit about. Uh, your equation with Adi and the kind of mentorship and guidance that you've received about Godrej Properties down the years. You know, then he, my, my, my dad's just uh, an amazing man. I think I always say that there's no question I've received a lot of business advice and, and learnings from him. Um, but really, I, I think the much more important lessons he's taught me are just about how to be a good person, um, how to be a good father, how to treat people with respect and dignity. And I think those lessons um, that he's been ingraining in all of us since we were young kids, I think they've gone a long way into making us who we are. And I think that's what I always feel more grateful for him. Honestly, Goodrich Properties was very much started by him, but it was not a business that was a business he sort of grew up in, in a sense. He had, you know, spent much more time in things like FMCG and our chemicals business and so on. So I don't think necessarily he taught me the ropes of the property business, which which um, I, I, I probably learned more, more on the job myself. Uh, but again, just watching him carry himself and the way he's conducted his career over what is now 60 years, it has been the biggest learning in and of itself. And what is your equation with Nisaba like? Because I spoke to her a few weeks, a few months ago and she described you so affectionately as the real rock in her life. Uh, uh, how would you describe your equation with her? Because you know, the two of you, I mean, you run properties, she runs the FMCG business now. And, uh, you know, but between the two of you, you run the flagships. Uh, what, what is it like from a business and from a personal point of view? No, it's it's wonderful to have such a close friend and relation and, uh, you know, also be a, a business partner the way, way Nisa has been. I mean, she's an amazing person who brings a huge amount of strength uh, to the table. I think her values and her focus on the long term and always doing what's best in the long term interest of the brand and the group has been amazing. She's a great eye for talent and bringing good people into the organization. Um, so yeah, no, it's a it's a wonderful relationship. Um, and we, we often laugh that we've come a long way from the days we were pulling each other's hairs when we, we were kids. Yeah. and. Of course, I mean, I have to ask you about the family division which is going on now. I believe you are engaged in that. I mean, uh, how is it to uh, deal with your uncles and uh, cousins about uh, settling the affairs of the group? I mean, is it a stressful time or is it being done amicably? Well, I don't think there's any any such thing there. I think it's where we're all discussing in good faith what is best for the future of the group. I think, um, you know, it's a group with a tremendous legacy that we're all equally proud of and something that we want to make sure we take forward with the same spirit, the same values, um, and do our best to really script uh, a fantastic new chapter for the group. So I think the, the discussions that are being held on how best to do that and how best to structure the group to achieve that are being carried on in, in very much the spirit one would hope.
And by when do you expect to see a final resolution, by which time everything would have been uh, settled uh, in black and white? No, then again, these, these, it's hard to put a time frame on these, on these discussions where we're discussing a lot of issues around what, what's best for the group and how best to structure it. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully not too long, but, but there's no, no, no different, definite timeline to any of these things. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I asked Nisa the same question as well. I mean, you grew up with a Godrej surname. I mean, what, how was it growing up as a Godrej and did it, do you have a sense of responsibility of what it entails and how you should be carrying yourself because of carrying that family name? No, it's been, you know, I think a couple of words that, that come to mind. Uh, then uh, one is just uh, great fortune or, or good luck to be to be born into this. Um, you know, it's it's amazing to see the kind of stories that we have within the group of, of what's come before, how people have gone about their work. Of course, there's a f tremendous business platform that's been created. But more than that, I think the how of how that platform has been created has earned the group and the brand so much trust and respect. Um, that it feels, uh, it, it, you know, you, you feel very proud of that legacy and certainly also feel the responsibility to do everything you can to script a bright next chapter in, in continuing that legacy forward. And it must be coming in handy in a business like real estate because, you know, it's a, it's a area, it's a sector which a lot of people have suspicions about. I mean, I mean, there have been so many scams and episodes with real estate in the past that to have a brand like Godrich must be as a must be a huge advantage or a card for you because it comes with a lot of trust. It certainly is, Oden, and I think you know if you look at it, um, we're probably the first developer to have set up a, a truly national real estate development business, and I think one of the things that's greatly facilitated that is the acceptance that we've had as we enter new markets. So whether it's from landowners who partner us or from the customers who actually buy from us. Um, I think whether or not they know of us as a real estate developer, they know of our reputation that we are you know, not going to uh, disappear from our projects, that we're going to stand by what we commit. So I think that has been a great source of advantage to the company as it's tried to grow across the country. I was reading somewhere that you have interesting personal passions. I mean, you, you're a keen chess player, but the one which struck uh, an even greater chord with me was that your fondness for rare books. Where did that come from? <laughs> um, it started a long time ago, actually. So it was about 20 years ago. Um, I was looking for a gift uh, for my then girlfriend, now wife, um, and decided it would be nice to get her a couple of her favorite books in uh, first edition um, and signed by the author. And I, as I was looking for those uh, books, which I which I found, I came across a couple of items that I just thought were so interesting. One was um, a handwritten letter by Rabindranath Tagore, thanking his uh, fellow Nobel laureate wow. um, Andre Gide for translating the Gitanjali into French. And I was like, this you know belongs in in some museum somewhere. What is, what is this doing on, on you know on the internet? Um, and there was another uh, book, Nehru's Discovery of India, again inscribed uh, to what I later figured out was Rajiv Gandhi's nanny, which I thought was quite amusing. But some of these things just, you know, just uh, seemed very interesting to me. And um, as they say, the, the, you know, one, once you get the bug, it, it sort of moves on from there. So now I've, I've been quite seriously collecting for almost 20 years and hope to eventually build a public rare, a public rare book library here in Mumbai. What's the most precious uh, item in that collection, you would say, other than the Tagore letter to Jeet? Yeah, hard, hard to say. Lots of, lots of highlights, things like Imperial Mughal manuscripts, a large collection of Gandhi letters. Um, so lo lo very hard to choose. It's like choosing your favorite kid, hard to do. <laughs> yeah, great luck with that collection, Virocha. It's been wonderful talking to you and my compliments on that excellent real estate company that you've built over the years. Uh, more. Good luck to you and thank you very much for your time today. Many thanks again.